Rochester and everyone watching on the Verizon contiguous channels. You've reached Visual Radio Live. It is the last day of January the 31st, 2013. The views and opinions on Visual Radio are those of the host, his guests, and not necessarily those of Winchester Community Access and Media, its board of directors, staff, management, members, volunteers, and all our affiliate stations, Boston Neighborhood Network, Bill Ricker, Brookline, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Welcome, Nick Thomasa. Thank you. It's good to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Same here. Again, didn't I see you Tuesday night at the City Council? Yes, you did. But I was Thank leaving you. and you were going yes. in. I was taking over for you. <laughs> what happened when I left? But they were basically just, uh, just kind of wrapping it up because by 8.30 everybody was out of there. They were in kind of a hurry to leave. At $29,000 a year, right? seven counselors, 27000 plus. 27, the, the president gets 30. And the vice president gets uh, 28200 28 or 29. 28200 Right. Wow. So that's, um, that's a lot of scratch. That's, that's a little, nice little part-time gig, I would say, for 48 meetings, average of two hours uh, every Tuesday. So figure that one out. What astounds me, Nick, is that it's I don't... 96 hours. Have you seen them affect any changes in Medford? I guys? have not, because it seems like the mayor's just taken over and he says the city council, he acts like the city council doesn't even exist. I showed you in the next room I have uploading right now the committee of the whole meeting. Right. What, after 26 years, why can't this mayor show up at a city council meeting and talk about the Department of Public Works, something very important, I think what he's afraid of is he's probably going to get a lot more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to make you know, himself look bad because he's probably going to run for re-election again. I had a question for him and I didn't ask it because Brianna Lungo Cohn, one of the counselors, asked, they have a new DPW yard over on Commercial Street. Right. Nissan cars move their cars out. Right. The roof is leaking. There was no heat. Now they have heat so that the they have guys, it at 55 degrees. The DPW guys were going back at the old DPW yard and hiding in the trailer to, to be heated. So what was the sense in having this great big building that they leased with no heat? And now the heaters that are in there were donated. So they didn't even, some were donated, I guess they bought some. So that they could the put heat. the trucks in there, for right. 55 degrees, and they wouldn't freeze. And did you know one thing? You can't even drive around the building, make a 360 around the building? No, I did not. No, you can't make a 360 around the building. I've gone by it. Yeah. You now, can't it, drive it, in the back. It's like a third world country. Exactly. That should be, in a way, that's a fire hazard, if you really think about it. Because, let's say, one truck pulls in on this side, and then the fire is here, so you only have one because this truck can't make it all the way around. You have to go so into the stop and shop parking lot, there's but a there's gas a station. Fence, yeah. yeah. And because there's a gas station behind it, that makes it all the more dangerous. Exactly, because you've got to figure one thing, a fire starts small, but it gets big in an awful hurry. And especially on the tower roof, it's not a single roof. I did not it's know not this. Vented. I know that Hurricane Sandy had um, that storage place across the street right. ripped the roof off of the storage place. Right. And that was a lot of damage. And so perhaps the, D the new DPW had a problem with the roof. We're talking Medford politics here in Winchester tonight <coughs> on visual radio. But, you know, the new town manager, Richard Howard, is the former Malden mayor. Mm -hmm. So he's now the town manager here. Oh, is that right? Now. You got smart. <laughs> I got something to tell you, Nick, and I told Gene Martin. Gene Martin was on here two weeks ago. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So it's fun. We're doing more Medford programming here in Winchester right. than they are in Medford, which is flooded right now. Yeah. But um, I volunteered to help out the station here. In the back, we have an auditorium. Okay. So I did the main camera, the, I mean, the, the middle camera, not the main, the middle camera. It was a three cameras set up in the auditorium for the town meeting. There were 240 people there. Wow. That's not enough to cover everyone. We have wards in Medford, and here they have precincts. P 
people are elected for the precincts in Winchester. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very proud of you people in Winchester because we don't have that in Medford. I'd love to see 240 people every meeting oh, yeah. of the city council. Keep them on their toes. Well, that's it. How many of us show up? So this is a town smaller than Medford, 56,000 people in Medford, and they have precincts where people are elected to represent the, city of the town of Winchester. And we don't have that in Medford. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's a big problem in essence because now, you know, I, I take the parks in Medford very seriously as far as cleanliness and safety because I do have five granddaughters that I do take down there. And it seems like there's one park that gets everything they want. Everything. I don't know this. Yes. If Off you of go, Central if you go to Logan? Go from Placeted Park. Okay. And then go to Logan Park and see the difference in the equipment, in the upkeep. My wife fought for two years to get that uh, tire swing fixed. At Logan? At Logan. Now, now if that happened to be at Placeted Park, it would have been fixed the next day. Now, Placeted's in West Medford? Yes. Okay. Right where the big soccer field is. Oh, okay. That's Placeted Park. Got it. Right out of West Medford. And the train along station's the there? Along the tracks. Yep. Right alongside of the tracks. And if you go down there and you see the equipment that they have, you know, that keeps the kids entertained. What do we have at Logan? We have one climbing thing and two slides. Two swings, which are for the older kids, one handicap swing and one child swing. You go over to place the park and it's like you double and triple the equipment. They have their play mulch replaced all of, every year. My wife again, which is called the troublemaker, she went down and, and we fought to get the play mulch in, in Logan Park. You're not troublemakers, people, when you do the right thing. But that's what you're called. Yeah. I'll, take you, I'll give you another, for instance, where she was just called a troublemaker. There was, there's no heat in some of the classrooms in Medford High. Did you know that? No. That's atrocious. We just had that deep freeze, and the kids were freezing in the classrooms. They wouldn't even move the classrooms. The teachers are buying space heaters to keep the kids warm. That's a shame. And that's dangerous. That's shameful, you know to have no heat in the classroom. The salaries, you know, Nick, I think if they cut salaries, Woburn, right up the street, $9,000 a year for city councilors. Right. Now, Woburn has all that industry. It's like a double city because you've got industry, which is major, and you've got a lot of people. Right. They're doing probably double the work, and they're more effective. I used to live in Woburn. Mm -hmm than these Medford City Councils who get triple, triple the money a Woburn Councilor gets. But somebody let it get out of hand at one time or another by giving them raises. Well, they give themselves raises. Well, the thing of it is if somebody has to sign off on it, they just don't say, well, I want this much money and just get it through. Somebody has to sign that paper on the bottom. Now, last Somebody has to sign that to approve that raise. This, it's just not going to go to payroll and say, well, we're going to give them another $10,000 raise. Well, it's interesting. I mean, they can want it. I'm sorry. Last time, uh, they voted not to get a raise. Mm -hmm. like our council, but the mayor got a raise. Right. But Camuso, Paul Camuso, who's in the sheriff's department, the nephew of the council president, wanted to get the raise and give it to charity. Why are you stripping the old folks in Medford to give it to charity? If they choose to give to a charity. Thank you. Not everyone agrees on the same charity either. Thank you. So if your charity is TriCap, let's say for instance TriCap Housing, and mine is the food pantry. And mine why is the kitty connection. Exactly. But why should you have one person making a decision for everyone? This is not, you know, a dictatorship. I thought it was a democracy. I went to Vietnam to fight for, you know, freedom, not to be penned down like an animal, you know, people telling you what to do, when to get up, when to go to sleep, and When did you go to Vietnam? Eat. 1968. 1968. And Thank you for your service. You're quite welcome, Joe. There's a lot of other guys out there that are 
you know, they get messed up over it. It's, yeah. it's a hot subject. It is. Uh, we don't take care it's of our veterans at subject. all. Well, we don't take... Now, you take, for instance, the, the weak-minded... I don't want to say weak-minded, but some people aren't, you know, so strong as others. And the heroin over there was 97% pure. It was like volatile. And of course, if you want to really screw up the enemy, give them drugs. <laughs> They're giving you drugs. That's what I'm saying. Where the enemy comes right. over there, exactly. feed them drugs, and right. screw them up. It's like me trying to find you in your own backyard. So now these poor kids came back. They're messed up. They're strung out on heroin, which and it's is their fault. Pure. It's and their, it's their fault, fault, fault for not being strong You take enough. a sec 17, 18-year-old kid, and you throw a rifle in his hand, and you say, get him. That kid is not even grown up yet. He can't even take a drink before he goes. He can't even legally have a drink before he, they send them off the war. And then they came back all strung out, so now they put them in, you know, rehab centers. What did they do? They closed all the rehab centers and put them all out in the street in Boston. I'll bet you if you go in Boston and count the panhandlers and everyone else, I'll bet you that 65 to 70 percent of those guys are veterans from the Vietnam era. Wow. Okay? And they throw them out on the street like dogs because they closed up the, the rehabilitation facilities and that was the end of it. What are they to do? Who's they? Who closed up these? The government. Because they wanted to save a couple of bucks. And the insurance companies. Well, that's another... Whole other... That's a whole other enemy. Whole other show. Right. Because they tell you they have people that have no medical backgrounds making decisions on what care you get. Wow. Okay? Non-medical people, not even a nurse, and they're making decisions on what care you get. They'll approve it or disapprove it. I have both my shoulders replaced, and it was in writing. We went to court. After the war? Well, after this you is came back from from after all the machine work, all to my, a lot of overhead work, so I wore out the joints in my shoulders and I had them both replaced. We went to workman's comp court in Boston, and it's in writing that they were supposed to pay for it. And some person with no medical background said, no, we're not paying for it. And they didn't pay for it. And I have a judge's order that's supposed to be done. Now I have to hire a lawyer and go fight the system. Even though you got a judge's order? Even though I got a judgment. A judgment, not a judge's order, a judgment. And they, they, they agreed to it. So it wasn't like they didn't disagree. But then a person in the office just said, hey, we're not paying for anything. They're not paying for the medication or anything else. How about the legal fees? The legal fees, you don't incur, you incur some, but you don't, you don't, you don't pay your legal fees unless you get a settlement. I did get a settlement, which wasn't big at all. It ended my career, work in Korea. But now they don't want to even pay for my medication. I got to pay for it myself. Every time I go to the drugstore, it costs me $30 every 21 days. Because that's just from one medication. Because they cut it down from 30 days. If, I, if a doctor writes me a prescription for 30 days, I have to pay $60, a double payment. We used to get a 30-day prescription. They cut it down to 21 days. Now, how much money did they save? That's four months they, have to, they don't have to pay for your medication. You pay it out of your pocket. And then you cut it down to 21 days, that even increases it more. So their interest in the board and the, uh, the, the, the start shareholders, and it's all a game. It's a game. And it's people's a, lives don't seem to matter. No, it's a cat and mouse game. Wow. If I knew someone in that office, there wouldn't be any problem. But I had to pay the first 500 when I went in the hospital. And then therapy, physical therapy, is $65 a pop. So I had the first shoulder done. And after the second shoulder, I decided, well, I'm not going to pay someone $65 to show me the exercises, which I already know from the other shoulder. I mean, who can afford to go three times a week, $65 a pot? 
That's just a copay through my own insurance rather than workman's comp having to pay for it. But we're talking about it here and maybe people will start thinking, this is important stuff. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Why do we have all those judges at workman's comp at the, the industrial board? Are they just there for show to collect money? Don't know. You should be able to go back to the same judge and say, hey, listen, judge, I have an agreement here. They refuse to pay. Why? And that judge should get on the horn to that company and say, if you don't pay within a certain amount of time, we're going to hit you for $10,000 a day. That sounds fair. Everyone else gets fined. If you go to put up a building and you don't get it up in time, you get fined so much every day. So have you tried going to the judge? You can't even get to the judge. You can't get to the judge. Now, it's not a court. It's, per essence, it is a court. Because the other side comes, you know, with their lawyer, and you come with your lawyer. But it's not going to a courthouse. It's going to a workman's court comp place. Or oh, it is a courtroom. Yes. You have the judge sitting up, and you have two tables, just like a courtroom. There's got to be some kind of oversight that you can reach. There is none. There is none. You have to hire another lawyer, pay him to go fight it. If a judge already granted it, why do you need to hire another lawyer? Have you, um, do you know that the city has two websites, Medford? Yeah. Medford Mass mm -hmm. and Medford.org. All right. Why do we have two websites, do you know? I don't know, because they don't post anything on it anyway. Well, on the MedfordMass.org, they have um, the commissions and the boards. And they have, like, city solicitors reappointed March 1st. I never knew we got appointed. No. So March 1st, the city solicitor is appointed by the mayor. Right. That's good to know. Mm. The cable TV commission's gone. It's missing. Right. Well, that's amongst... That's, I would say that's a lack of maintenance because... No, he shut down the board. Because do you know Bob Scary? Yeah. On the school committee. Right. Okay, Bob, I've known for years. So... Um, Bob said the, the, the site's missing. He's on the Cable TV Commission. Mm. Him and uh, Richard Giovino, yeah. the accountant. Right. They're the only two left. Now, Raymond McDonald has been dead since 2007. Yeah. He's still on the Cable TV Commission. Oh, really? The oh, mayor has a dead man. Oh. And I hear it's not the only deceased person on a board in Medford. So when you have dead men tell no tales. <laughs> so this is the oversight. Now, I'll tell you a little about the Cable TV Commissions. When the mayor brings Verizon in, He's supposed to have his five-person commission do the negotiating, then they go to the mayor. Clearly, this mayor does it all himself and has a phony. I mean, it's just phony. If you have a dead man on a commission, it's a phony commission. That's like I stated at the beginning of our conversation. It was like the mayor thinks that the city council does not exist. He doesn't think any of us exist. Exactly. I just switched gears because you were talking about the judges, yeah. and I asked if there was oversight. Right. So I want our viewers to know that there is he, no wins, he wins in a judgment. He gets a judgment. And there's no oversight to enforce the judgment. I go to the cable TV commission about the Verizon license because Bob Scarry, who's uh, he's a senior fraud investigator at, for the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. for housing, I guess, and stuff, okay? Right. Uh, whatever. Uh, and he's a great guy. And Bob's on this cable TV commission. He said to me last January, everything's going to change with Verizon came in. And the mayor, the mayor blindsided him. <laughs> did you actually believe that? Or he did believed you take it. take it as a joke? He believed it. Yeah. And um, Bob invited me to dinner. We haven't gone to dinner yet. I believe. Is he buying? Uh, I don't know. But <laughs> I know he and the mayor allegedly go to dinner once a week. And the mayor stopped going to dinner with him after he was talking to me. So, Wow. I guess you I have that effect on bad people. apple, huh? <laughs> I'm a good apple. That's why the mayor doesn't like it. That's a, you're a bad apple to the politicians. <laughs> well, you know, it's a little transparency. Right. Um, this shows transparency, and and it's uh, and you live in Medford, and you're here in Winchester. Do you do you know the question I ask the mayor every time I see him? No. When are you going to retire so I can run for mayor? What does he say? He just laughs it off. You know, his daughter's now living in Medford. No, maybe she's prompting up for the job. That's what we think. She was living in Andover. Why would someone move to Medford from, from Andover. Andover? Her husband's William Breslin Brady, it's a like, lawyer. 
She met him at the UN or Joe Biden's campaign. The mayor's daughter, Kathleen McGlynn Brady, worked at the UN. Mm -hmm. And she worked for John Edwards. Right. Then she worked for Joe Biden. Right. She met her husband in 2010. They got married. Uh, Bob Mayako's mother-in-law's house was just sold to William Breslin ba Brady. But you see, Nancy Cephas, who was Mayako's mother-in-law, sold to William Brady. No one realized it was Bob Mayako to Mayor McGlynn until <laughs> I put it on my blog. Yeah. But the people don't know what's going on. People don't understand because people, you know, you get, you get a lot of people like myself. I, had, I was working two jobs for 25 years. Now, how much did I pay into Social Security and everything else, right? They're talking about Social Security going broke. They were taking 300 bucks a week out of me almost. Where did that money all go? Well, it's like our sewer commission with that $6 million. The exactly. mayor gets a million and doesn't put it back. You get a kid, you know, children, they have to have structure. They have to have a certain amount of discipline. This is what it's all about. You have to, you know, keep your kids on the tight rope. If you let them run rampant and they get out of control, now he gets labeled as, as HDHD. ADA, ADD. ADHD. And then they go to the Social Security office and they get money for it. They get money for it. You get, you know, I wasn't born in this country. Where were you born? I was born in Brazil. Okay. In 1956, we were supposed to come to this country. My father died. I was five years old. Sorry. My mother had four kids. My sister was born six months after my father died. And she never so, knew her dad. No, I had an uncle here that was sponsoring us to come here. And as soon as he found out his brother died, he stopped writing, cut all communication. So we found a cousin. And it took us seven years to get another visa to come to this country. So you'd come to the country and visit your uncle? I never looked for him because oh. after he stopped all No, no, I, I mean when your father was alive? Oh, no, we didn't come to this country. We couldn't afford it. The plane ticket alone was like $1,500 each. And at that time, you're talking a lot of money. We were farmers. Do you so speak Portuguese? I used to, but there's a lot of... When I came to this country in 1963, there weren't too many Brazilians here, so... And in the house, we spoke Ukrainian because my grandparents and parents were Ukrainian. On your mother's side? They migrated to Brazil oh. <clears throat> during oh. the war. Because to the United States, they weren't taking anyone with kids. They were only taking adults. So Brazil was taking everyone. And my grandfather said, either we all go or no one goes. He was caught three times and sent to Siberia. <laughs> trying to escape, you know, the, the communists. Because the, the, the communists wanted Ukraine because it was on the Black Sea. They needed, they needed a resort to send all their big shots for their vacations. Like we're, our lobbyists send out politicians. You know, you go on a five-day cruise or you go on a 15-day junket or whatnot. And it's all, there's no bill. And that was the same with Russia when they came into the Ukraine and took over. And those poor Slavs were fighting with sickles, hammers, and whatever they, weapon they could have. Holes, and, you know, whatever instrument they could get, a club. Wow. And it was, I mean, they were overpowered. Look at Russia, they have all the guns and total control. So he escaped from there, but finally the last was when he left the Ukraine, they went to Poland, and somehow they got to Africa. And from Africa is where they were taking people to Brazil with everybody, with kids and all, and the United States were only taking adults. And that's how we ended up in Brazil, and I happened to be born down there. So when you were farmers, where were you living? What part of Brazil? Way south. The last to the the second to the last state on the Brazilian map. As and a what's below this? Chile or? Well, Chile is over to the left on the, on, on the ocean. But we're talking about where it comes way down, narrows, where they just had that fire there. 
Oh, just nod to that. Oh, 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 oh. just nod to that. I mean, that kind of hit home when it was so close, so far away, but it was just so close where I was born, and I was 12 when I left there. But it was devastating. Awful. I don't know how you can have a club with a thousand people and it had one exit. It's, and then it's the not bounces, logical. And then the bouncers are pushing them back in because they think they're all trying to run out on their tab. Why are you running a tab in the, in the bar or nightclub? You bring me a drink, you pay me the money. Well, it's like the station fire. The bouncer for the band wouldn't let people out the back door. Right. Um, right. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It'd have to be an awful big guy to hold me back because yeah. I would have mowed him down yeah. like he was a paper statue. That's just like 9-11 when they were trying to hold the people back into towers. You'd have to be an awful big guy to hold me back because you know yourself, when you get angry, you get twice the power. And I mean, I'm not a weak guy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just unbelievable what goes on, goes on and goes on in this world and just... We've covered the gamut here. Uh, local politics is where it all starts and not enough people get... How did I get dragged into it? The TV station. Mm -hmm. they, 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 were, they were rude to me uh, back in 2002. So this has been going on for 10 years and a month. Yeah, right. You know, what, Unbelievable. You know what aggravates me is, is the housing. That aggravates me a lot. You get Section 8 housing, a woman that really needs the help with some kids, and then she moves her boyfriend in who doesn't work. So now she gets housing, she gets food stamps, and whatnot, free health care. It's you don't mind bit. helping the people that do need the help. But when you move your boyfriend in and I have to pay that rent, that boils my buns. It's a little worse than that. Do you know that in Medford Housing, if you go and look at the doorbells, allegedly it's a who's who of Medford insiders. Is that right? Yes. You did not know that? No, I did not know okay, that. Okay, so go to the doorbells at La Prise Village and, and see if you know... Uh, it's crazy. Now, you're aware of this West Medford Hillside Little League? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this is uh, fellow Stanley Coleman's. City Council President says he always did a good job. I'm like, man, yeah. Now, someone else in the city doesn't want to be named said to me, Joe, everyone knew. So the mayor's alleged cousin, Chip O'Leary, was the president at, for a time. You get the mayor's cousin as the president. This guy, Comins, who's now been arraigned, mm. He was on TV3 announcing the sports with the mayor's uncle, Gene McGillicuddy, who just got bounced by the governor out of the Medford housing. Because I went with the camera from here, mm -hmm. and I asked Uncle Gene, why are you related to the mayor? And he said, you know, hi, Joe, I'm the mayor's father's sister's husband. <laughs> and Deval Patrick appointed me. I went to Deval Patrick the next day, and on the 28th, it was the 18th, 28th, 29th, Deval Patrick removed him. It took 11 days. Wow. But within three days, I got it in motion. Wow. Paul Donato goes, well, that's a coincidence, State Rep. Paul Donato. Yeah. So you really think so, Paul? You think it's a coincidence that I taped Uncle Gene and I went to the governor? And you don't <laughs> think I didn't have help on that? And he goes, oh, I didn't work alone. No, you never, have, you never have to work alone. There's always somebody out there willing to help. Yeah, but these people <laughs> willing to help, how come they don't put their name on the line like me? But the thing, they were afraid of them. Yeah. They were afraid of them. And then the next week I'm at the council and Brianna Lungo Cone goes, do you have any relation to the mayor? And it's like, <laughs> I did the heavy lifting and now they're laughing and they're asking the question of these people being appointed to boards and commissions. But if I didn't do that, guess what, Nick? They all knew. Oh yeah. Because I went up the week before I went to the housing meeting and I implied that they all knew and they all just stare with that blank stare, Camuso yeah. and Della Russo and Mayako and they, they knew. You know what it is? It's a surprise that you knew. That yeah, they but got caught. Uncle Gene was at TV3. He was running right. TV3. But the thing of it is, is they were surprised that they got caught. They thought that everything would be swept under the carpet and it would just go through with flying colors. Nobody would say anything and it would be done, a done deal. It was a Medford housing meeting at the Medford Housing Authority on, on was it Riverside Ave, right? right? Do you know that a lawyer in the audience jumped up and tried to object like it was a, a courtroom? Object at a meeting? You know what I said to him? I looked at Mark Rumley and I said, you, sit down. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. Now, a lawyer for the city who's out there yelling that it's a separate body politic, 
he should not be standing up unless the board of directors of the Medford Housing ask him for an opinion. Right. So here's this lawyer for the city who should be on my side because I'm a citizen, right. objecting because he knows that his buddy, Mayor McGlynn's uncle, is about to be exposed on camera. Right. But they never expected me to go to the governor. No, no. They figured that he would just bark a little and go away. And now Gene re was removed, and then Robert Cavell had to be removed because Gene was the safety net. Mm -hmm. And Bob Cavell, the sheriff's brother-in-law, got removed. So your wife is called a troublemaker? Oh, yeah. I'm public enemy yeah. number one. Well, she's close to you, though. Because Tell her to get the camera. Tell her to borrow a camera. They'll hate her even like every more. Every time she gets something in her head, she goes after it. Good for her. And she's called a troublemaker. Good for her. Oh, it's a troublemaker again. That's what she gets. You know, your, your, your granddaughter comes home from school and says she's freezing in the classroom because there's no heat in there. Are you just supposed to sit back and say, well, that's okay. Just put a jacket on, honey. Sit in, your, sit in your classroom with a winter jacket on, freezing, so you can't concentrate on what the teacher's saying. You're concentrating more on staying warm. And when we had that deep freeze, those classrooms must have been down in the teens also. And who do you with go no to? Heat. Roy Belson? Who do you talk to? Well, she called the principal, and she called the, the, the city, you know, the, the city hall. And then she finally called the, city, the school committee. I, as a matter of fact, mentioned it to uh, Rick Carriello the other day. Caraviello. Right, right Caraviello on Tuesday. City councilor in Medford. Right. And I mentioned it to him, and he said he was going to make a phone call. They said they need a part. How long does it take to get a part for a heating system? Wait a minute. The part should have been ordered last summer, exactly. not when the freeze hits. Right. And Winchester residents, <coughs> be thankful your kids have a nice warm school. Oh. It's nice in here. Yes. Because uh, we're in Winchester High School. Yes. And it's nice in here lights we're happy but you're hearing what's going on next door in medford and it isn't pretty um people don't realize all of the uh the cousins and the uncles and the nephews and the well it's a lot of nepotism because tons in medford tons look at what they're doing they they just uh, the governor he's taken and he's appointing people to posts we have they have no background in barney frank should have been center i think he should have because he knows and then he gets out. But he didn't do as much for the governor as Mo did. Well, there's another theory. So now what would, it, what would happen to Mo and his relationship if he didn't appoint him? You know, there's another theory they said on the news last night that Deval Patrick wants this guy to run for governor. Oh, my goodness. So he's giving him a high profile. Well, he's, he said, like, he's not interested in any, you yeah. know, any running for any position, but I don't think that's going to last. Because didn't, didn't President Obama tell us that if he couldn't straighten out part of the uh, deficit that he wasn't going to run for a second term? I, hear, I heard him say that clearly. I like Obama. No, no, but I'm just saying. He yeah. said if he couldn't do, deal with the deficit, he was, gonna, he was not going to run for a second term. So do you have a, you have cable TV, right? Yes. And uh, what do you have, Verizon or Comcast? Comcast. So you see the franchise fee at the end of it. Mm. So the money, mayor gets all this money from a franchise fee, 1.7 million in 2010 and 2011. The, the city council couldn't get 400 bucks, 400 bucks for a playback deck. Wow. He would not give them 400 grand out of 200, $400 out of 200 grand he had sitting there. He used it for salaries. So I put a public records request in, and Ann Baker said to me, well, first she told the city council it was for cameras. These cameras here, 15,000 each, high end, if you right. pay high end. If right. you get them used, maybe 7,500. Right. That's not 200 grand there. If these are 15,000, no. that's 45,000. Yeah. Not 200. No. So I go into her office and she goes, oh, 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 Joe, it's the big machine that goes with the cameras. I go, what, the Hubble telescope? Is it on the roof, Ann? Where is, where's the Hubble telescope you bought? Mm -hmm. 200 grand? Yeah. Then I write a public records request, and she finally answers it. It's the salaries at the high school. Oh. So that franchise fee you're paying, instead of going to Access TV, you're paying for three salaries at the high school. But you don't know this. It, we're just supposed to shut up and not know where the money's going. Where's our excise tax dollars? I like to know. 
Oh, you know that little thing. You know, do you ever buy two cars in one year? No. Like I couldn't I, afford two cars in one year. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, I, you trade one in and you get another. Right, right. So in Woburn, I was in Woburn, and I had one car, and I paid the excise tax. Right. Then got another car, traded that one, and got another car, paid the excise tax again. And I'm thinking, not for nothing, but why am I paying two excise tax bills? Well, they're supposed to prorate your first car. More than that. Oh, I was one of the few who asked. Mm -hmm. They said, go upstairs. The woman laughs. She goes, we have hundreds of dollars of people money, of their money. They never think to ask. You'll get a check back in two weeks. I go, wait a minute. I'm paying you now. And if I don't pay you, I get fined five bucks and 20 bucks. And you, know, you guys just stack it. But you're going to take two weeks to give me money that you never told me you owed me. I had to come up here and ask for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they prorate it, but they don't tell you. So if you don't go up and look for your money, they take both your excise yeah. tax on the two cars. After a certain amount of time, they, that money's theirs. Yeah. That money's theirs. Now, it was 20 or 25 bucks, but times 10,000 customers. Right. That's a lot of scratch. But it depends on the year of the car, too. Right, right. But even if it's because 25 Because it's not bucks, just, you know, a set amount. It's per thousand. Right. So now, how many people out there have Lexuses and Cadillacs and everything else that are worth more money? So now it's 1500 or 2000 For an excise tax. Right. And they keep all this money. And hopefully you won't find it. Hopefully yeah. you won't find it. If you go to Attorney General Martha Coakley's site or Secretary of State William Galvin's site, you'll find uh, nonprofit. the nonprofits list their annual summaries because they're corporations. Mm -hmm. TV3 Medford. Legal, $24,663 last year. <laughs> Do you know why? Twenty-four grand to the mayor's cousin, David Scarry, Bob Scarry's cousin, he's also McGlynn's cousin. He got twenty-four grand. He sued me. They lost. I won. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> they dragged me in a court to shut me up. That's why I'm here in Winchester. They don't want voices on the air, so they sued me and they lost. All right. And in a court of law, I was telling yeah. this to a TV3 member last night on the phone at midnight. In a court of law, my lawyer asked me, and I read, 2000 to 2005, no legal bills. They didn't even a, a lawyer on, on retainer just to look at their books with the accountant. You know, you want to have a lawyer just yeah. to have, you yeah. know, make sure everything's legal. Yeah. No legal fees at all. And then they started fighting me and City Hall and a friend of mine, the late Pat Fiorello. Yeah. So they, they, they litigated against him. They put a criminal complaint on him. 84-year-old man. They said he threatened to kill them. He was 82 at the time. They, they, he was bullied to death. He would probably take a swing and land on the ground. <laughs> he was a dear friend of mine, and they bullied him to death. So anyways, but, you know, uh, $24,663 to sue me. They lost every penny. We could have bought a building with that money. But no one realizes the, the amount the lawyer got was $86,000 over the... And I read it all to the judge. Johnny Byers was there. He said the judge was not happy when you were hitting those numbers and looking at the attorney smiling. No. He laughed all the way to the bank. Well, they, they don't care as long as they get the money. Money, money, money. Money's the worst evil in this world. Unbelievable. Well, it's the, it's the, it, it's the people abusing money. Money's not a bad thing if people, if, if everything was just equal. But things aren't equal. But the thing of it is, is every time you get a new politician, it seems like they owe so many people that they keep hiring these people for positions that don't even exist. Oh. Chelsea because Housing. Because they owe them. Chelsea Housing, 360 grand a year. Right. On the books, though, you know, as far as on paper was, he was supposed to be only getting 160. On the housing books, but on his, right. on his returns, he put the true right. figure. Because that's all the kickbacks. Oh. You want an apartment? How much you gonna? How much you gonna? How much you got? I never thought of that. What do you think? You get into the project for nothing? Did you know that it was against the law Silly for the housing me. department to ask for your W two form before they give you an apartment? No. Yes. So if you have six people in the family, and they all work, and they put down that they make sixty thousand a year, they only pay so much for rent, while all the other five people live in there making good salaries. I know a family that lived on the South Boston Projects. 
they had nine rooms, right? Guess how much they were paying for rent? $60, and that included nine rooms, heat, hot water included. Well, if you'd like to continue this conversation, think of other things to talk about. Um, we can have a panel here. We can have Gene Martin come in, Anthony D'Antonio, and mm -hmm. have a panel of things. But, you know, this whole thing of the Medford housing and, and uh, the who's who that I'm hearing of Medford Notables relatives at these housing. You know, Johnny Byers had to wait two years. They're all intertwined. We're talking about it, and uh, I'm still breathing. I can't believe yeah. I'm still breathing. Yeah. We have a, uh, a guest from Texas that is going to talk about The Lady Vanishes. You're invited to stay if you want to hear about Hitchcock. Sure. He's a great guy. Um, we do this every, just about every week, but he was in Turkey last week. You ever been to Turkey? No. He and his wife decided to go to Turkey. Frank isn't in. We'll continue. Oh, you there? Hey, Frank, how are you? All right, what's new? Hey, say hi to Nick. Hey, Nick. How hi, you how are you? We're talking to Texas. Oh, Texas. Very sound, very good sound. Hey, Frank, what happened in Turkey? How was it? Turkey. Oh, you're lost. We're losing you. We flew into Istanbul, saw the big city. And then we flew out. Do you ever hear of a place called Cappadocia? Not me. Okay, well, neither have I. Uh, neither, I, I, I dare say not one in a hundred Americans has heard of it, but it's an uh, it's, uh, incredible tourist site. It's a huge valley with these sandstone structures that people have been digging into for centuries to build churches and homes and all that. And we stayed in a hotel that was dug into the dug into the sandstone because they're still doing it. And I had no idea it existed. The church is a great place. The food is great. Uh, got a bit too much cheese for my taste, but, but uh, I couldn't leave the bread. You know, Houston's a great place to live, but we do not have good baked goods down here. You, you Easterners are, are got to admit compared to comes to bakeries, and Turkey had great bakeries, so I loved it. Oh, very nice. You're breaking up a little bit. Okay, uh, what I, do? I don't know what, we're on your landline, right? Oh, uh, yep, you are. Yeah, it was very strange, because uh, it was coming in loud and clear. But you, you had a safe flight, and you're back safely, and that's good. Yeah, and uh, tonight's movie is Alfred Hitchcock's The Lady Vanishes, which is a hit, and which solidifies Hollywood's plans for great I think last week you showed Jamaica Inn. That's right. And, and that was uh, the last movie Hitchcock made it even we went to Hollywood. Actually, Jamaica's Inn is on this Friday, and Lady Vanishes is next week, uh, February whatever. Oh, okay. I'm a week out of... I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm doing that intentionally so that we, we have a week uh, leeway. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, we're talking about Lady Vanishes tonight, right? Yeah. Okay, because we talked about Jamaican last week, I think. Right, we'll air tomorrow night. I've already got it in the queue. And usually Hitchcock's cameos are early in the movies, but on for the Lady Mashes, this is a train that's in between the, the hero heroine and their trip. Hey, Frank, I should Frank, I should call you back. It's 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 terrible. Frank, are you there? Oh, let me try again. That's the worst we've had. Yeah, started breaking up towards the end. Yeah, it was terrible. Sometimes it's the connection. Hello, people. And we're getting nothing now. Well, that windstorm could have. The windstorm. Hey, we're gonna try. We're gonna try Frank again. Thank you for your patience, people. We want to do it right or not do it at all. And 844. 
We go to 855. Joe, you there? Hey, Frank, that sounds better. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I guess, I guess we're down to minutes left. That's okay. No, we got some time. So the lady vanishes. Lady vanishes, and for those people who look for Hitchcock, uh, you can relax. He doesn't come in until almost the very end of the movie. There's a scene when the two, uh, the romantic leads, Michael Redgrave and Margaret Lockwood, have a scene in their train compartment. And right after that, they go out to the station. You'll see Hitchcock right there. So you can relax through most of the movie. When the train gets to London, that's the time to look for him. <laughs> and was it cut in London? Excuse me? Was the movie made in London? Oh, it was made, it was, no, it, well, almost none of it takes place in London. It, it takes place, uh, it, well, it was made in a British film studio, uh, Ipslington, I think. But, uh, and, and they're all close to London, but it, so it was filmed in Britain, it was filmed near London, but not in London. There's no location sites in London, nor does there need to be, because uh, it all takes place on the train. And I was thinking about it, you know, in the 30s, uh, you could probably go through every, take a, there's an outstanding film made every year in the 30s that takes place mainly on a train. Because, you know, trains was a way to travel, and if you, if you took a train from uh, Los Angeles to New York or, or the other way, you went through Chicago, and you were on the same train for three to five days with the same people. So it was like a hotel on wheels, and it was a great place to set a movie. So movies like 20th Century and Night Train to Munich largely take place on trains, and I guess the last great train movie was uh, From Russia to Love, which is largely on the Orient Express. And that's pretty much what this one is. It's, it's on a, it's on a, it's a, it's a an espionage drama. And I won't give away too much. The title gives away it all. The, there's a lady who goes missing and, and on the train and what happened to her. And uh, then the, most of the movie is them trying to find her. And then they find her and they figure out what the plot is by why she disappeared and all that. So it's, it all gets very convoluted. But it's easy to follow. So uh, it's, it's a good film in that sense. Uh, Many, many Hitchcock aficionados consider this his best movie. I'm not one of them. I like this movie, but it's not his best. But this has been very popular with people who like Hitchcock. Um, this was Orson Welles' famous favorite Hitchcock movies. Uh, Francois Truffaut, it's his favorite Hitchcock movie. That's impressive. Yeah. And it, it wasn't nominated for Best Picture by the Motion Picture Academy, but it was Best Picture of the Year by the New York Times. And Hitchcock won. Hitchcock never won an Oscar as Best Director, and but he did win. He did win one uh, the New York Film Critics Award, which is, I guess, in those days, number two in prestige. And he and that he won it for this movie. Well, do you think uh, movies like Psycho or uh, mystery movies, at that point in time, didn't lend themselves to Oscars? You you ha you have a point. Uh, the. the most of the, the Oscar winners at this time come from a handful of studios, and of course this is not one of them, this is a British studio. And, you know, as far as, you know, you look at some of the old horror, you know, I'm a horror movie fan, you look at some of the, the performances, and you say, gee, that should have got some more critical recognition than it did, but they just didn't. And the same with Mysteries, it was, there was a certain, well, this is, this is I actually wrote an article on this once, the, the cultural battle of the 20th century between culture being handed down from the elite to the commoners and culture bubbling up from below and, and affecting everybody. And Hitchcock was definitely in the second class because he didn't, he didn't go for prestigious stuff. He went for you know, mysteries and film noir and, and tales of intrigue, which, which made rousing good entertainment, but, but, which weren't the kind of things they taught you that in school that you were supposed to like. So yes, there was a certain snobbery about, um, about award giving, a certain, uh, you know, Oh, well, I'd say in the critical circles, too, the more lofty the, the aspirations, the easier it was to get a good review. Hey, it was the same in music in the 1960s. Yeah, I mean... Mitch but, Miller was at Columbia Records. He didn't want rock and roll to come in. Yeah. So, uh, that, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, you could write that in, in many aspects. You know, where, where does culture come from? And, and I think when the 20th century began, it came from an, an, an on-high elite and was handed down. And when the 20th century ended... It was almost the opposite. The, uh, the really exciting culture was coming from, you know, like jazz. Jazz is a classic example. Uh, uh, the, you know, growth of the you know, film noir and horror movies and all that. They were they were considered trash when. Well, I shouldn't say about film noir, but horror movies were considered pretty lowbrow, and they are probably the most studied genre of the 1930s now. 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, you have a point. I mean, it would be hard for Hitchcock. The type of movies Hitchcock made didn't give him a leg up in the Oscar running. Uh, I, th- I, I don't have a list of his Oscar nominations in front of me. I think he got nominated for Psycho, but but uh, when you go back and you look, I mean, his, you know, he made some good movies. He made good movies. He made bad movies. Uh, his, mood, his great movies tended to be very good, but he had some real clunkers in there. But, uh, you know, they're... Good or bad, he was trying to. He was trying for something individual. He didn't go with the flow, and award. You know, awards can be conservative, and I'd say that's you know probably. Well, I'll, I'll say it. It's, I think it's truer in film than in music. The, you know what I'd like to see, Frank? I'd like to see retrospective Oscars. So you look back through the lens of time and say, did Psycho deserve to win that, or did the movie that really won it deserve it years later? You know. Well, there actually there's been a movement. There's, well, there's been movements towards that. They come and go. You know, should we go back and honor these old films? And actually, they, they, the films that are honored are the ones that aren't forgotten. So, you know, something official. I don't think I don't think the Oscar people ever touch that. That's uh, but it's talked about. I think one, one thing, uh, the okay Hitchcock is near the end. The opening scene. And we have to be careful because this is a public domain movie, and you don't know what. And there's a lot of you know. A lot of versions of public domain movies because footage falls out every now and then and it gets back in. But the opening scene is, is you know, a snowy train station and all that. And pay attention to that because that's all miniatures. And, what we, you know, we often don't realize uh, in, when watching 1930 films that some of the scenes we're seeing are, are miniatures. It's a miniature train. And, and this is a miniature train station with little miniature, you know, mannequin people there who actually are moving slightly. If you keep your eyes on them, you say, oh, they're not really moving, but then they do start to move. But then it's obvious that it, obvious when you look at them, they're not, they're not uh, actual people. It's, it's just a, a miniature. And there's this whole, you know, the studios had a parallel universe. They'd have the, the film, the full-size sets where all people act, but they'd often have the miniatures side by side of them because no CGI in those days. And heaven knows they weren't going to build a train station for... Uh, a clip that may last maybe 30 seconds, so they, they got away with what they could. And it's very cunningly done. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, in this movie, is this Michael Redgrave's uh, first movie. I believe it's actually his second movie, but I, th- I think that his, his movie before this was uh, he had a non-speaking walk-on, you know, cameo-type thing. Lynn Redgrave's... Uh Brother, husband? He is the, he's Vanessa Redgraves and Lynn Redgraves' father. Oh, okay. So he, and, uh, and Colin Redgraves' father. Colin wasn't in the movies that much. And, uh, but he was mainly, like a lot of the British actors, he was mainly on stage. And because the, uh, because the, London, because the British studios largely were, were a short drive or a short train ride from uh, London, a lot of stage actors could go there during the day, film some scenes, and then come back for the, the play at night. So I don't know if he was simultaneously appearing in it on stage while he filmed this, but that would hardly have been unusual. Uh, the grand old lady of the movie, the, the lady who vanishes is Dame, Dame May Witty, which is a name that you, uh, you may not have heard before, but as soon as you see it, say, gee, I've seen that face a thousand times. She, she's, a 70, she's a pretty spry 73 for this movie. And uh, she, she's perfect in the part. And the, and the, well, I won't say who the villain is. <laughs> I've given it away. One, one thing to watch in this is there's two rather uh, ridiculously British Britishers in there who all they care about is cricket scores or whatever. And the, the two characters, Caldecott and Charters, all they talk about is British. I mean, the, about is uh, cricket. And the... Uh, you know, there's intrigue going on around them. There's all this drama, and all they can worry about is, am I going to get back in time to see the cricket matches? So, and these guys actually became kind of cult favorites, and they, and they, the characters and the same actors appeared in in a handful of movies in the late 1930s, early 1940s, basically playing these these uh, ridiculous stereotypes of British cricket fans. So you recommend it? Oh yeah, I recommend this movie. And that's that's our time tonight, Frank. I'll talk to you next week. I think next week we're talking about The Manx Man, another talk movie. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Sorry he didn't hear you. No, that's okay. I just had a comment that, you know, most of the good films that never got an Oscar or whatnot, they were honored by the people that watch them. There you go. The viewers. And we hope you viewers out there enjoyed our conversation about politics and movies. 
And there's a lot out. more, but we only we don't have enough time. I could sit here for five and a half hours and let you know what's going on in this state, in this country, but I don't want to sound like a blabbermouth. Thanks, Nick. The views and opinions are ours, not yours, but you can enjoy them. Thanks a lot, people. Thank you, Judy Kellerman. Good night. <laughs> Good night, folks.